Well, it's my pleasure to be uh, to be here with you this morning. It's as, uh, as uh, Siobhan said, it's my second opportunity to be in your beautiful country um, th this year. We, I was here earlier in the spring with the Ashoka Change Nation event, which was truly a spectacular, uh, spectacular three days that uh, I believe did, did your country proud, and I was very honored to have been a part of it. And it was at that event that Siobhan and I got to, uh, to talk just a little bit about some of the interests and, um, and work that's going on here in the whole realm of uh, nurturing natural supports. And if I were to describe what it is that I do, that this has really been uh, my life's work, is really working to understand uh, how to nurture natural supports, how to gather some uh, the lessons uh, from each time that we've tried and the work that we've done in order to accelerate and extend the impact uh, and grow the, the opportunity to nurture more and more supports. So my, uh, my work began in this area in part, by the way, as a, as a family member. My husband and I have five children, one of whom uh, has a disability. Our daughter Liz is uh, in her 30s today. Liz uh, is uh, a poet, uh, a power lifter, <laughs> and um, an artist, and she also lives with Down syndrome. She lives uh, independently in, uh, in downtown Vancouver in her own apartment. Uh, primarily because of her own force of will. So she's been uh, really a great, a great teacher for us in all the thinking and the work that we've done. What I want to do today to share in this really brief time that we have um, a little bit of some of the learning that we've cultivated uh, over what I would say two organizations. So the first is an organization called PLAN, PLAN Lifetime Advocacy Network, which is an organization created by families to answer the question, what's going to happen to my relative with a disability when I die? Okay. So, uh, and, and when we really looked long and hard at that question, uh, we saw that there were two core pillars. One was financial security, but the other big core pillar was the underpinning of that question was not what's going to happen when I die, but who is going to be there when I die. And in order to answer that question, we created a very strategic and focused approach to developing what we call personal networks. So I'm going to share with you a little bit about that and uh, some of the lessons that, we, uh, that we've cultivated along the way. And then I want to, and I, and I have some stories and so on that I'll share, a little bit of theory, and then I want to just tell you how we've taken our learning and we've married it with online technology today in order to get these lessons, these knowledge, and these tools out into the water supply. So first off, just a little bit here about core principles. For us in our work, relationships are the key to a good life. I'm um, just going to flip back here. Hopefully it'll go back for me. There we go. Um, that we can have all the programs and services that uh, we can imagine, but none of us can imagine having a good life without people who know us and love us and care about us. So we decided right then and there that that was really where our focus would be in the workup plan. Um, secondly, that everybody benefits. When we actually invest in a natural support approach, when we invest in facilitating relationships, of course the person in the center benefits, but everybody who participates benefits. Thirdly, that there is no disability or challenge that precludes relationships. And um, I've done lots of these presentations over the years, and inevitably there's somebody who will say, yeah, but you know, my child can't do this, or what about this situation with this person who's got this behavioral challenge, or you know, the list can go on and on. In our experience, there is no disability that precludes relationships. And thirdly, or fourthly, sorry, it does take, though, effort, focus, and perseverance. As uh, Christine noted, just simply being in the community doesn't mean that relationships flourish. There is an effort and there's a strategy that need to be put into place to cultivate relationships. So let me begin with a little story to, uh, to illustrate uh, what, what it is that we do at, within PLAN. 
I'd like to introduce you to David Cohen. Uh, David came to plan uh, with his mother. As it turned out, his mother was in her 80s. Her health was failing. He was an only child. He lived in the basement of the family home. Very, very unique character. Uh, David only ate his meals in hospital cafeterias. He knew entirely how to get around the city of Vancouver by transit, and he knew the hours of every hospital cafeteria. He did not have a single person in the world that he would describe as a friend. He had no brothers and sisters, and uh, he had a very sort of prescribed and structured life. His mother knew her health was failing. She was very worried what was going to happen. So what we did is we hired a person that we call a community connector. And the Community Connector has a job, literally, to weave relationships together, to pull a, what we call a personal network into place. The Community Connector has no other responsibilities. They are not life skills workers. They are not uh, you know, care providers in any other way. Their job is really to be this connecting uh, uh, resource for someone like David. And the first thing that she did, and this is the first thing we ask all of our connectors to do, is nothing. Literally what we ask them to do is to sit and get to know the person. Who are they? What is their essence? What do they love? What do they care about? And in David's case, she discovered a couple of pretty amazing things. One was that he was uh, a passionate letter writer. He's, he's really, uh, he was a true advocate for social justice and he wrote so many letters for Amnesty International. We actually wondered if he had single-handedly single brought down Suharto. You can see this picture here where he is in front of his uh, a typewriter. He also uh, got a, a word process, you know, a, t a computer out over the years, and that made him even doubly efficient. So anyway, she found out about that particular interest of his. And then the other interest that David had was he was a great lover of, pas of uh, classical music. And he would attend every symphony concert uh, that was held in the city. So what the connector da, did was begin to pull some people together. She went to Amnesty International, where there were some connections, and uh, began to invite them to spend time with David within this, this network. Similarly, within the symphony, some, some classical musical music players and so on. And David had a little group around him when his mother died. Uh, that little group helped David move out of the family home. They helped him manage some of the inevitable day-to-day -day things when he lost his keys or that the place needed painting or uh, got him to get so he could qualify for a hearing aid. I mean, there were various things just along the years that happened. It was also this group that began to notice that David was, a couple of years ago, that he was beginning to lose his balance. So they were with him enough and they could see this an unusual, there was a shift in his gait and so on, and they got him to a doctor and, and the uh, prognosis was, was very sad in that he had a brain tumor. And so what this, uh, his network did uh, with David is they really, in such a beautiful and honoring way, uh, accompanied him to the end of his life, basically. The, all of his wishes, his choices, uh, the way that he died uh, was truly the way that I hope I die in the company of people uh, who love me. And one of the pictures that you see up here is the, uh, it's right in the middle of the bottom, is the conductor of the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra, who was one of David's circle members, or his uh, network members. And this is just shortly after David passed away that um, this was an evening that the, uh, his name is Bram Waltovi. He got up on stage and he described, he said, you, know, you may have seen this, uh, this gentleman come to the symphonies and he didn't really adhere to social niceties and he looked a little different than many of you do, uh, but he was uh, a profound lover of classical music as you are and one of the greatest fans of our symphony. And tonight, I'm going to dedicate Mozart's Requiem to David Cohen. Right.
So David had, in the company of his personal network, a good life. And indeed, um, this life, his friends were um, really the medicine of life, this old proverb for him. And he also had um, a good death. But you know, um, there's lots and lots of research, a little bit of uh, what uh, Christine referred to as well, in terms of what our networks, our relationships bring to us. So I want to just get slightly theoretical here as we move a bit away from, uh, from the story of David to talk about, you know, why is it important? I mean, it's so important to us, obviously. Of course friends are important. But you know, the body of research in here now in terms of the relationship between our health and our network is profound. We live longer, we get sick less often, we heal more quickly. Um, in many countries now, uh, our uh, networks or our relationships are considered to be a determinant of health. But it's more than that even. Our employment and academic success are completely tied up about who knows us and who supports us. And by the way, this stuff isn't just specific to people who've got particular labels. This is true for all of us, okay? Our safety, again, completely tied up with the people who know us and love us. I'm away from my home right now. Who's looking out at my home? Well, my neighbors are, as just one example. Who is it that reminds me to uh, make sure that I uh, bundle up warmly enough if it's, if, it, if it's a cold day, or that I get the oil changed on my car. I mean, there are just many, many tiny things you don't even think of in the safety realm, but are completely uh, in the hands of our friends and family who love us and care about us. In addition, problem solving, creativity, coming up with solutions, all related to our networks, our basic resilience, um, you know, the minister this morning was talking about our capacity to respond to chaos. Well, our resilience is completely tied up again in the quality of our relationships. One of uh, David's network members had a great quote. He said, you know, in terms of David, I mean, David really was an unusual man. And, and he said, you know, the problems don't go away. We just get better at solving them. Right? So that's really a piece of this resilience. And lastly, presence, which is a, a term that I like very much because presence is, is a, a dimension of humanness, of human being that I believe only comes uh, from being loved. It's a, it is taking our place on the human stage uh, in the company of others. So all of these are the keys uh, to a good life. So I did mention earlier that everybody benefits when we actually invest in relationships. Care providers, you know, and you might not think about it necessarily, and, and there was some careful wording around not taking anybody's role here and so on. Care providers, and I'm careful with this term, like I, care, I get carers and uh, I, I may not use it quite correctly, but for me, care providers are people that are paid to do a job and it's a very important role, but it's not enough. It doesn't equal a good life for a person. Uh, and secondly, um, it's often a very difficult and lonely job if you are a paid care provider supporting someone who does not have natural relationships. It's an extremely, uh, there's so many, there's so much dependence upon you and the loneliness of the person is very powerful as well. That's an impact. So knowing there are others is great for care providers. Um, it's great for network members. All those health benefits I talked about for social networks, health benefits actually result to the people in the networks as well. It's great, obviously, for family members knowing that there are others involved. And lastly, of course, uh, very, very good for the person at the center. I just threw this picture in here because I love it. Um, this is uh, not too far from my home. You can see some of those uh, uh, mountains that, uh, that surround us in British Columbia. And what I love about this picture is um, you actually don't know who the person with the disability is in this picture. What you have are people fully engaged with each other, enjoying each other's presence. And in the end, that is the dimension that we're seeking to cultivate more and more of. 
So what I want to do now is share with you a couple of very quick lessons around creating personal networks. Now this is based on 20 plus years of experience. We've got, uh, you know, a whole, we've got probably close to 80 of these community connectors in Vancouver, but we've replicated this program in 40 locations around the world, so lots of experience in doing it. I'm only going to share a couple of very quick lessons with you today. Um, there's, there's lots more available. There's online training. There's all kinds of things if this is an area that you're really interested in, in terms of focusing on connecting relationships. First off, for us, what's a personal network, and I really want to distinguish it, it is a distinct form of social network. It's an intentional community of social ties that link people to one another to create a web of support. So I think the word intentional is very important here. This is where we really do say, you know what, uh, in order to facilitate the caring relationships that and the caring that the, this person has to give to the world and the caring that others have to give to them, we're going to be focused, intentional, and strategic. We hire community connectors, as I said. Uh, community connectors, uh, by the way, it's a very, very tiny piece of work. Average amount that they might work are two to four hours uh, a month on a particular network. Again, this is not about uh, doing any other kinds of care tasks. It is about creating the network. And their, um, their, their core work is to weave, and by that, who does the person know, who did they used to know, who might they want to know, what are they interested in. So there's a very focused approach to finding all that information out, facilitating people coming together, coordinating the events, and then monitoring and evaluating how is it going, Do, is this working, do we have momentum? Here's a couple of lessons just to share with you about connectors. One is that it's about hospitality. You know, uh, what are some of, what are some of the, uh, the arts of hospitality? The Irish are actually famous for, I, I think, much of this. You know, some of the arts are things like welcoming, inviting, asking, including, right? These are the, think of any magnificent host you know. That's some of the character traits you want in your connector. This is a story about Mimi. Uh, Mimi is, uh, she was, uh, uh, when her connector got to know her, what she discovered about Mimi was that her mother, just in an offhand conversation, said, oh, Mimi used to love to bake. She would always bake with me. And so Ruth, who is her connector, Ruth is the person at the very front of the screen with the black vest and white blouse, Ruth loves to bake too, and she said to Mimi, would you like to do more baking? And uh, Mimi said, yes, she would. So this is Mimi's baking circle. They get together uh, weekly and make wonderful things. But what I want to show you is about how Ruth extended hospitality. Because the woman on your right-hand side of the screen um, showed up one morning at Ruth's church. And the, uh, the pastor introduced this new member of the congregation. Now, Ruth, being a hospitable, generous, welcoming person, of course, went over to welcome her to the congregation. And she said, do you like to bake? Right? And it was from that invitation that she became a part of Mimi's network. So you can see that extension of hospitality, and it's a situation in which it's good for everyone. It's also about strategy. Um, there are stages to a personal network uh, overall. There's an exploration stage, there's an active development, and then there's a maintenance stage. We say it takes at least, if somebody really has nobody to name as a friend, it's going to take a couple of years to get a set of trusted relationships in place. Second lesson I want to share is that interests and attributes are key connectors. So finding things that people are interested in or that they care about or that they want, what their goals are, this becomes the, uh, the pathway. And there are a variety of passions out there. Um, and you'd be surprised. I mean, this is a, a, a local steam engine. And the connector for this, uh, this particular network came back and told a story. She said, you know how Robert is always talking about trains? She said, well, you know, I, I sort of thought it was a bit a part of his disability, but when I took him to the, the group of all the engineers who are passionate about trains, 
They all talk like that, right? This is Michelle. Uh, she had a great love of, she has a great love of snakes and spiders. Uh, big signs on her front door, keep out. Um, and uh, we found her the reptile refuge where she volunteers saving reptiles. I'm definitely running out of time here, so we're. And I'm just. I've got two quick things to to uh, share with you. I want to make the point about it takes time, perseverance to create a network, and uh, really a couple of years. And then I want to very very quickly show you where we're taking this knowledge into an online environment called Ties. So Ties creates personal, private, secure online networks. Little bit like Facebook, no advertising, no data mining, closed personal networks. These are some of the features that are uh, in a network. You can message, schedule appointments, tasks, stories, photos, and so on. And then just by, uh, by way of con concluding, I want to uh, introduce you to Maggie, who is an, uh, she and her family are an avid, are avid ties users. And um, so Br Maggie, Maggie's dad, Bruce, posts on her site, keeping family and friends uh, informed. And um, most recently, uh, Maggie has begun to do uh, some writing on her own Thai site as well. And uh, so he, it's great for practicing her writing as well as, again, keeping all the family engaged. And when I look at her and I see this young girl like this, uh, this is the future for me of people with disabilities. And for me, um, when we put all this together, uh, the, this work of nurturing relationships is what we ultima ultimately unites um, all of us. The yearning to belong, the yearning to be part of something bigger than ourselves is universal. And for me, we're quite simply better together. Thank you very much.